Good morning. <laughs> it is a beautiful morning to be with one another, and thank goodness we are warm inside and together <laughs> to worship this morning. Let us stand as we sing our first hymn this morning. started this morning, if you could not tell. <laughs> oh, let us greet one another with the love and peace of Jesus Christ. Welcome those of you guys who are joining us for the uh, first time as guests, or if you're coming back again, we are grateful to have you, especially those of you online as well. Let, uh, let you guys send some emojis to each other or saying, hey, how can I pray for you this morning? If you're thinking of anyone uh, who may need to to hear that they're um, loved and uh, have grace this morning, just text them, say, hey, I'm thinking about you this morning, friend. How you doing? Um, yeah, that's all, good, all those good things. Let us turn to scripture this morning. I opened the Bible this time. <laughs> As opposed to last week. <laughs> All right. Scripture comes this morning from Isaiah 9, verse 2, 6 through 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land 
of deep darkness, on them light has shined. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty King, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace. For the throne of David and his kingdom, he will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forever more. The, ze the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God indeed. Let us continue to sing this morning with full hearts and praise and rejoice in this season. Thanksgiving weekend. Happy first Sunday of Advent. Joy and hope and peace to you. Uh, at this time, we're going to have our kids' message. And because we are starting the Advent season, part of our kids' message this morning is going to be the long beloved tradition of lighting our Advent candles. Um, and so, because our theme for Advent is expecting Jesus, there's an Advent hymn. If you're, uh, are y'all familiar with the song, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus? All right, so here's what we're going to do. Each Sunday of the kids' message, as the kids come forward, we're going to sing the first verse. The kids are going to come up. We're going to light the candles. And then as the kids go back to their seats, we're going to sing the second verse, which works out nicely because the hymn has all of two verses. All right? So, so if you are fifth grade or younger, come on down. And congregation, let us sing our Advent carol. Come thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free from
right, so our kids are very excited. All of them say, I remember this from last year, which is awesome, which is why we do it. Okay, so if you remember this for last year, do you remember, do we light all of the candles right away? Yeah. No. Uh, we wait for some of them. Why do we wait for some of them? Some of them are special. -er. Well, Because the big one we light on um, super duper close to Christmas. Yeah, on Christmas Eve, because the really, really big one shows us that something special has happened. The big one reminds us that it's it is... It's in the is, middle. It's in the middle, because we light the purple candles for the season of Advent. And Advent is the season of waiting for the birth of... Jesus. Nice. All right, let's do that again, but a little bit louder. Hey, Eli, can you participate in that one? Are you ready? The, the Christ candle in the very middle signifies the arrival of the birth of Jesus. Oh my gosh, this is why we love children in worship. Amen. <laughs> yeah. So do you want to do the J's for Jesus song? How about after worship between services, we'll do that song. Okay. All right. So the purple candles, we're going to light one every single Sunday because there's four Sundays until Christmas. And each one, I know that goes very quick. I know parents are like, oh, that's so close. Uh, but we are going to do something else special because we worship in church and also we worship at home. So we, I hope, if you didn't pick these up, I hope you will pick these up. We have these super cool cards that we're going to do. Our theme for Advent this year is expecting Jesus, okay? Expecting Jesus, like if you're expecting something and you're very excited about it. Hold on one second. Christmas. Just like Christmas, absolutely. So we have these cards. I know, ooh, aren't they beautiful? That is a number one. That is a number one. So what you can do if you take these cards is you can put them, and adults, these are for adults as well, you can take them and put them in a basket somewhere. You can hang them up with little clothespins and make like a whole uh, garland out of them. And then each day, this is going to start December 1st, which I think is like Wednesday, right? Wednesday is December 1st. It's just like a Christmas countdown. That's right. So each day of Christmas, all right, I need a volunteer. Okay, all right, all right, I'll tell you what, you each get one card, so here's what we're going to do. You are going to show us how this works, okay? Are you ready? All right, so hold it up, hold it up with the number facing this way. Okay, so then on the 1st of December, we're going to flip it open, flip it over, and show one name of God is, can you read that? Creator. Creator, all right. Can you flip on the 2nd day of December, you're going to flip it over, and it's going to be... Alpha and Omega, all right? And then on the third day of December, you're gonna flip it over and it's gonna be? I am. Huh? And then on the fourth day of December, you're gonna flip it over. Eli, if you read this, I'm gonna be very impressed. It's El Shaddai. It's El Shaddai. I'll give you. I know you can't read it. It's in Hebrew. It's a Hebrew. But what these are, and all of the names in here, these are all different. I know you got, you got a really easy one. These are all different names for God. Because when we, get, we, we finally get to Christmas Day, which is December 25th, the name we're going to flip over is... Jesus. That's right. So families, we want to make sure that you are participating in this. So uh, we have these Advent countdown cards are on the table. We also have for, for families that want to read a little bit more, we've got a daily devotional with reflections that are written from our sister church down in Jupiter to Cuesta, Florida. Um, but these are many, many ways that we are going to count down to the coming of Christmas and we're going to make room for the name of God in our hearts and in our lives. Okay. All right, so there's a scripture on each of these. So here's what I want you guys to do. Will you guys do me a favor, and will you put your cards right here? And we are going to, yes. 
There is one white candle for Christmas. That's right. All right, will you guys do me a favor and stand up? And our, we are going to light our Advent candles. So here's what I want. I need two siblings to help me get the fire. All right, will you guys help me get the fire? And then you two, we're going we're gonna to get the fire, and then you guys are going to help light the candles, okay? All right, so here we go. Congregation, if you will sing our Advent hymn as we light our candles. to deliver born a child and yet a king born to reign in us forever now thy gracious kingdom bring by thine own eternal Spirit, rule of all our hearts alone, by thine all-sufficient merit, raise us to thy glorious throne. We are going to pray. One is pink because in some traditions on the third Sunday of Advent, we celebrate the word joy. And joy is a little bit lighter than the days that we sit in on other days. So today our word for Advent is hope, okay? Will you guys pray with me? All right, repeat after me. Ready, pray. Dear God, creator, alpha and omega, El Shaddai, Thank you for Advent. We are waiting for you. Come into our world. Come into our lives. And set us free from sin and fear. In Jesus we pray. Amen. All right, guys, you can go ahead and go back to your seats and help us continue to worship this Advent season. So as we were lighting the candles, there was a lot of conversation about how many candles. Um, and so if you saw it, there was a cute moment where I was like, all right, this morning we light one, next Sunday we light two and three. And then when we said Christmas Eve, they were like, we light five, we light all of them. Which again is that's the joy that we sit with and wait in for the season of Advent is to make room for that joy to come as Christ comes into our lives. Um, we have several announcements this morning. Let me just grab my bulletin. Um, and first, first up is this Tuesday, we're going to gather in the fellowship hall um, as well. Um, yes, we're going to have a listening and processing session, especially for those who were at the church conference uh, the Tuesday before, I don't know, a couple weeks back. Um, we really want to make sure that folks are, are gathering in a spirit of listening. We're asking everybody to read Ephesians 4 before you come. Um, and just so everybody knows, we're not going to be doing any voting. Um, it is really just a time to come and sit and gather and listen and pray for our church and get on the same page. Um, we also have on December 12th, that's not next Sunday, but the Sunday after, we have our Christmas cantata. And I have to apologize. I think I announced the time incorrectly last Sunday. Um, so just be very, very careful to mark your calendars that on 12-12, it fits nicely, on 12-12, our worship service is not at 9 o'clock. Our worship service will be at 10.30. All right, repeat after me, 10.30. There we go. On 12-12, it'll be a 10:30 worship service. It's one service. We've got some special musicians that will be up here. Um, Sunday school that Sunday will be at 9:30. So check with your Sunday school classes. I think some classes are meeting, some are not. Um, so just check with your Sunday school classes at that time. That same evening on the 12-12-12 um, is Luminaria, which is a celebration in our community. And so at six o'clock, we're going to gather on the front steps um, with Millie and some other musicians, and we're going to do a brief, just fun time of Christmas caroling out front as we light the Luminaria and participate in this community event of Luminaria. 
And then we're also asking you to mark your calendars for the following Thursday. I believe that's December 16th at 6 p.m. in the chapel is going to be our blue Christmas service. So if you know somebody in this Christmas season that is grieving um, or, or just wrestling with any types of grief, it can be the loss of a loved one, a loss of a job. Um, on the, the December 16th, we encourage you to, to invite folks. Um, I, I know one of my favorite parts of that service is we have ornaments and you can write the name of a loved one that is no longer with us and you hang that on a tree and we bless the ornaments and I I find it incredibly moving and meaningful each year um so please know that's going on. And then we do have, we are doing three Christmas Eve services again this year. Um, and so we are doing an early service at 3.30. We're doing our 5.30 contemporary, 7.30 traditional. Um, and to that end, I'd encourage you also on that welcome table, I don't have my card with me. Um, Tim Ware was kind enough to print a bunch of invitation cards. Um, and so, uh, yeah, there we go. If you want to hold yours up, Tim Bush. Um, they're beautiful. You are welcome to take one for your own, you know, for your own reminders. But we really, 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 really want to encourage you to take that one of those cards and give it to somebody else as an invitation. In fact, take 20 cards, give away 20 of them. I simply ask that you give it in, in conversation. Don't just like leave it under somebody's window shield or throw it at somebody out down an alley. Um, we want to make sure that, that there's a conversation involved um, and just say, hey, this is, you know, we're, this is where I will be Christmas Eve. We'd love to have you with us. I'm going to the 3.30 service. Um, so yeah, we want to invite folks. I think that's plenty of announcements. Um, and so I want to I ask you, if y'all would want to speak up for a minute, what are some ways that we want to pray for one another and pray for our community? I'm going to, all right, how about we'll pray for some childlike joy. Tim. Okay. She's home, home and still needs some, some healing and care. Yeah. Are there other prayers this morning? Pardon? For folks that are homeless, yeah. Praise for Tim's mother, Frances. Yeah. Prayers of joy for Frances, who turned 100 this year. We've got some other birthdays as well. So, yes. Prayers for your family. Absolutely. Are there other ways we can be in prayer for one another? I will ask, I know we have um, Carol and Terry, their uncle passed away this week. And so if you could keep Terry and Carol and their mom, Virginia, in your prayers as well. All right. All right. Let's pray. Even if we don't say them out loud, God knows the prayers that are on our hearts. So let's pray. Gracious and holy God, we praise you and we thank you. In this holiday week, we thank you for the ways that you've been present at tables and in homes and in the streets. Lord, we praise you for the God that you are. And in this season, ask that you would open our hearts, open our lives, that we would make room for you, not merely on the outside, but that you'd be right in the middle. Lord, come, Christ. If there are ways that we are held back, we ask that you would set us free. We ask that we would hear anew your promises for justice and grace and peace and hope and that you would bring those and set us free from anything that would hold us captive in fear or sin, that we would live into your light. Lord, we do ask for childlike joy in this season, not merely because it's expected, but because you are present and there's joy in that. Lord, we pray for those that are grieving or hurting this morning. We especially lift Virginia and Terry and Carol and Joanne to you. We pray for those who need healing, for those like Lee, and for those who are newly home from the hospital. Lord, may you hold them in your healing grace. Lord, we pray for those who are homeless and experiencing the cold, Lord, we pray for those who are hungry, and we pray that we as a church would be part of your work of justice and grace, too. 
Lord, if there are spaces where you're calling us to stand, then call us there and give us the courage to listen. We also celebrate in this season. We thank you for Francis and her hundred years. We thank you for those who are celebrating birthdays today and those whose birthdays are close by because we know that this is a season where we celebrate your birth, God, your presence in this world among us, in the dust, so that you may lift us out of it too. So we pray for families. We especially uh, pray for, uh, for families that are named this morning and for those in our own families where there is strife or hurt, bring your grace. Where there is joy, may that be celebrated. But here and now in this season of Advent, we sit with your people, recognizing that there are spaces of dark and shadow, and also recognizing that it's in those very spaces that your light has come and will come. So gracious God, who was and is and is to come, we praise you. And in your holy name, we pray, echoing the words you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. At this time, I'll invite you to bring your offering forward. We have offering plates. Um, we also have online giving. There's a QR code on the back of your bulletin. Um, and for those that are worshiping with us online as well, we are grateful for the ways that you support missions. I will also simply say on behalf of the finance committee, we are also asking folks to continue bringing pledge cards forward. Um, we ask that we have all pledge cards hopefully back by uh, December 12th. So let us give to God as a sign of grace and worship and offering. story of 
right, at this time, I'm going to invite um, forward. We have a, a guest preacher this morning. This is Reverend David Holliday. Um, he was one of, well, there were 14 folks who joined the church last Sunday. Uh, so David and his wife, Mary, came and started worshiping with our church in the midst of the pandemic and said, all right, we want this to be our home church. And the Sunday after they joined, he's already preaching. Um, and so, yes, thank you. Um, and thank you. Good morning. It's good to be here. It's good to be with you. Thank you, Emily, for sharing this time. And I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I am uh, sinfully still stuffed <laughs> from, from everything that we had to eat. Gospel lesson comes from Luke chapter 1 with verse 26, and I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of the gospel. Luke says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by these words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. The gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Be seated. You may be asking why I'm reading that passage now rather than on Christmas Eve. The reality is that event didn't happen on Christmas Eve. It happened some nine months earlier. Gabriel delivers news that Mary is to be the mother of the long-awaited Messiah. Wouldn't you like to have been a fly on the wall to hear that exchange? In the face of such astonishing news, it's not surprising to me that Mary asks a question. Now, it's interesting to me, not only what she asks, but what she doesn't ask. She doesn't say, why me? Gabriel tells her why. In spite of the fact that she is really in her culture and her society a nobody, Gabriel tells her that she has found favor with God. And what that means and what that tells us about Mary is really stuff for another sermon. Mary doesn't ask, when will this happen? Gabriel doesn't give her an exact timeline, but the implication is that it will happen now, or if not now, in the very, very, very immediate future. In good true Jewish tradition, Mary should have asked for a sign as proof, but she doesn't. She doesn't ask Gabriel for proof that he is, in fact, a messenger of God or that this plan is on the up and up. Gabriel gives her the proof that she doesn't ask for. He tells her 
that her elderly cousin Elizabeth, who has borne the shame and the stigma of being barren, of being childless, is now six months pregnant. And that pregnancy, too, is the handiwork of God though her husband Zachariah did have a little part in it. And Gabriel tells Mary something very important. That in the face of what is seemingly impossible, that where God is concerned, what? Nothing is impossible. Mary doesn't question God's ability to do what Gabriel reports will happen. She does ask, how can this be? How can this seemingly impossible thing happen within her as she is a virgin? That's a very practical question. It's a very understandable question. I submit to you this morning that the answer to Mary's question, how can this be, lies behind everything revealed to us in Scripture. Everything. Everything we know and understand about God. Everything we know and understand about God's dealing with humanity. Everything we know and understand about Jesus, why he came, why he died on the cross. Everything we know and understand about the work and the presence of the Holy Spirit among us. Everything we know and understand about the reason for and the purpose of the church. Everything. That's a high bar. Everything. I think the answer to Mary's question, how can this be, reveals the very motive, the very motive of God's interaction with us. Now the answer that Mary receives from Gabriel is profound. And it too is stuff for another sermon. Gabriel tells her, that the power of God will come upon her and the Holy Spirit will overshadow her, will cover her over, will surround her, will envelop her. And that answer seems to satisfy Mary, but it leaves me with a few more questions. I'd like to know what overshadowing is all about and how that works. Perhaps to clarify, at least maybe for me, some of the ambiguity of that announcement, let me point us to another passage of Scripture that's already been read this morning. But one where I think the answer to Mary's question, how can this be, is a little more specific. From Isaiah 9, the people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. Those who live in a land of deep shadow on them, light has shined. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests on his shoulders, and his name is called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. And he will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. To the people of his time who lived in spiritual darkness and much sorrow, the prophet points to light at the end of the tunnel and the coming of joy. The prophet points to the birth of a child and with some of the most beautiful poetry in the scripture says that this child will embody the life-nurturing names 
of Messiah, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. As a musician, I can hardly say those words without hearing chorus from Handel's Messiah going over and over in my mind. As beautiful as those words are, they are just what will happen, not how it will come about. The how is revealed in the last phrase of verse 7, which is often omitted when the passage is read, just as I omitted it a minute ago. Or it's read as an afterthought. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. I think that's the crux of the matter. I think that's the answer to the question, how can this be? Well, you say, well, of course, God's going to bring it about. But how? The prophet is very specific. The zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. Well, what is zeal? Zeal is defined as great energy or great enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause or an object. We might say with great zeal the lawyer defends her client. Or the football player zealously strives for the Heisman Trophy. Um, zealously doesn't want to stay on my ear. In the Gospel of Mark, they were studying in my Sunday school class, and that's a shameless plug. In the first half of the Gospel, when Jesus performs a healing or an exorcism, he tells people, don't talk about it. Don't say who I am. He's trying to keep a lid on his popularity. But in spite of his attempt to do so, the gospel writer records over and over and over again that people zealously proclaimed what God had done for them in Jesus. With great energy and great enthusiasm, they proclaim what God has done for them in Christ. What is God's zeal? What characterizes God's great energy and God's great enthusiasm? And what does God pursue? I want you to write down four things this morning. You can write them on your bulletin or offering envelope or put them in your phone. That's okay. Write it in your Bible. Don't write it on the hymnal. Here's the first one. Number one, single-minded. God's great energy and God's great enthusiasm is characterized by one driving purpose, one single-minded resolve. The second one, write it right under it, because we're going to create kind of an equation here. Absolute devotion. God's great energy and God's great enthusiasm is characterized by complete love and loyalty. Complete love and loyalty that is undiminished, unfading, never failing. Absolute devotion. The third one, relentless yearning. God's great energy and God's great enthusiasm is characterized by a fierce persistence coupled with an intense longing that never gives up. Relentless yearning. The fourth unstoppable desire. 
God's great energy and God's great enthusiasm is characterized by a want, a desire that is impossible to prevent. We may turn from it. We may not want it, but we cannot prevent it. Unstoppable desire. Single-minded, absolute devotion, relentless yearning, unstoppable desire. To the right of that, put an equal sign and write zeal of the Lord. All of this zeal, all, this, all of this single-minded, absolute devotion, relentless yearning, and unstoppable desire is in pursuit of a single purpose and a single object. Put an arrow sign to the right of zeal of the Lord and write these two words, for us. Or if you want to make it more personal, write for me. For us. A child is born. For us, a son is given. The incarnation that we prepare to celebrate reveals God's great commitment, God's great zeal to be present with us, to share our lives be present with us in a way that seeks to favor us and to bless us. To be present with us in a way that, as Gabriel described, will overshadow us with single-minded, absolute devotion, relentless yearning, and unstoppable desire. The zeal of the Lord is revealed and made manifest to us in who? in Jesus who came and lived and died for us so that we might live in relationship with God that we might share his life in God that God might show us God's favor and God's blessing the Apostle Paul understood this zeal when he wrote these words to the Romans. What then is there left to say about all of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will separate us from the love of Christ for us. Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors. We are more than just those who overcome through him who loved us. For I have become absolutely convinced that neither death nor life, nor angel, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God for us in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The incarnation is not the miracle of a virgin birth that we believe, and that we celebrate. It is a zeal, a single-minded, absolute devotion, relentless yearning, and unstoppable desire that we experience. It is a presence that we come to know and we come to trust. And again, the incarnation is the manifestation of the zeal of the Lord for us. And Jesus is the manifestation of God's single-minded, absolute devotion, relentless yearning, 
an unstoppable desire for us. When the time comes in a few weeks for us to celebrate the gift of the Christ child, let us take a moment and ponder with Mary just what lies behind this gift. And let us ask with her, how can this be? And let us, like her, be overshadowed with a single-minded, absolute devotion, relentless yearning, and unstoppable desire of God for us in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. As we end worship this morning, let us stand and sing our final hymn together.
All right, don't forget, if you haven't already picked up your Advent cards or your Advent devotional or your invitation cards to invite other folks to worship with us, please, please, please grab those on the table on your way out. There's a couple on that back pew. And for the record, I'm going to sneak out and grab some more of the Advent devotionals off the printer. So if you don't see me for a second, just give it a minute and we'll be right back. Um, But... For now, thank you, David. Um, We'll send you forth with this blessing and this benediction. May the zeal of the Lord come upon you. May the spirit of the Most High be with you to do what seems impossible, but is not impossible for God. May you go forth from this place with the blessing of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May your heart be open to expect the coming of Christ to come and do marvelous things. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. Go in peace and hope.